Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jean, the Digital Event Coordinator. I'm Manager at Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. We are part of the Info Exchange Group, a not-for-profit social enterprise that tackles the biggest social challenges by creating use of technology. Today, I'm very excited to welcome you to join the delivered, opened, and clicked improve the click-through rate of your email program with Erica. She's the Senior Co Consumer Engagement Manager from Nation Builder. Erica has been working in the space of community organizing and engagement for seven years. She's worked with not-for-profit organizations with as few as 100 supporters, all the way up to 500,000 supporters. She has experience re-engaging and quiet audiences and invigorating membership programs. She has a background in science and passionate about using data and wisdoms to engage audiences thoughtfully and creatively. Before we begin, we'll start with a bit of housekeeping. All lines are muted, so if you have any technical issues, please type into the questions box and I'll be here to assist you. If you have any questions during the webinars, please also type into the questions box and Erica will get them answered by the end. Just try to make it as interactive as possible. There's no silly questions, so ask whatever you feel like. And please note that your questions and comments will not be up here to the entire group. Now, the webinar is being recorded. You'll get the recording and also the presentation deck in one to two business days. And there's also a very short survey at the end of the webinar. Please help us to complete that. All right, now I'll pass on to Erica for today's section. Thank you. So Erica, Hello, if everyone. You... Yep, you can hear me. Lovely, yes, thank you. Hi everyone, it is a privilege to be here today. I wanna to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I work and live, the Muwanina people. Um, I'm here in Tasmania. I wanna pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, so thank you for joining me. Um, you've learned a little bit about me from that introduction. I have, I'm here to talk to you about how to get your emails delivered, opened, and clicked. And I work for Nation Builder. So very brief introduction to where I'm working at at the moment. We are a software company. We build software that builds movements, as you can see on your screen. We've got um, a CRM or a client relationship manager, if you've never used one of those. Communication suite of tools, uh, a website and fundraising tools as well. So Nation Builder does specifically these things, but um, throughout this presentation, the wisdom and the knowledge that I'm going to be sharing with you can be applied to any platform that you might already be using. Of course, if you're not using one yet and I'm thinking about making a switch or starting up, I'd love to chat to you more about Nation Builder. So get in touch with me after, after the presentation. Um, our product uh, is focused around our product principles. We believe that people should own their own data, that we put people at the center of everything that we do, and that you should put your people at the center of everything that you do, that people need to be moved to action. And that means you can't just meet someone and you know, ask them to donate $500 the next day, unless they're the right kind of person, of course. But um, generally people need to be moved to action in a series of, of steps. And we know that oftentimes not-for-profits and advocacy groups don't have enough people in their staff to make the change in the world that they want to see. So we believe in distributing leadership, in being able to find those people that um, are really engaged and help and getting them to help you with delivering your message. These are a few of our, of our customers in the country. Australia and New Zealand in this region, just so that you're, you know. Now let's get on to this topic of how to increase your click-through rate. 
I wonder if any of you um, had a thought when you uh, signed up to this webinar of like, why isn't it open rate, right? We used to talk about an open rate as being the metric that people wanted to measure when they're sending email. And um, now we're talking about click-through rate. So before I go any further, I wanna to talk to you about why that is. This, this space of email deliverability is changing. It changes very quickly. And I mean, in a matter of months, it changes. So um, one example of a big change is happened in May of this year when Apple Mail or Apple's email service provider went ahead and implemented some new privacy settings. So if, if your supporters had an, mail, uh, had an Apple Mail email address, or if they were checking their email through uh, an Apple device with the Apple app, they could enable a privacy setting which would hide the engagement of your email with their inbox. So what that means now is that sometimes when you send an email out in an email blast and you get your email stats back, even though it says 30% open to the email, that 30% number, that figure, isn't so accurate. And I'm gonna just tell you a little bit more detail about the technology behind making that metric. So I don't know if you've ever wondered, but how, how does Nation Builder or any other CRM know if somebody opened or didn't open an email? Well, the answer is there is a little transparent image loaded onto every email that you send out. It's called a pixel and it's, you, you don't put it there, it is there. Uh, and whenever this image is downloaded onto the server of the inbox of the person that you sent to, that is how the CRM knows it was opened. So essentially that image is loaded and now it's an opened email. Well, the privacy settings that Apple Mail put out, um, which are similar to others that have been put out, they're not the only ones, they download all of the email messages to a separate server, including those images, and therefore it kind of masks that real engagement. And so because of that, what we are suggesting is that open rates are still important, but they're a little bit of a vanity metric. So you want to focus on your click-through rate because if somebody clicks through your email, they had to have opened it. And that's why this webinar is focusing on the click-through rate. So we're gonna talk a little bit about email deliverability uh, right, right at the top. How do you send great emails, which results in good email deliverability? And for anyone out there that doesn't know what email deliverability means, email deliverability means the science of how emails who, which are send actually get delivered to the inboxes because not all emails that get sent actually get delivered. So how to send great emails, which helps your email deliverability, you need these three things. You need to send the right message and you need to send it to the right person at the right time. This results in a successful email program. It results in open rates that are high and click-through rates that are high. But this isn't very easy. And there's some things that are working against you, even if you're doing the latter as best as you can. So number one in this little diagram on the screen, in the dark blue, email sent does not equal email received. Like I said before, you might send 5,000 emails out and only 3,500 might actually land in a person's inbox and maybe fewer of those will actually land in their primary inbox. This is because number two in the purple, Internet service providers or email service providers, same thing, they can block your emails based on educated guesses. An example of this is Gmail. I use Gmail personally, some of you may as well. Gmail does a pretty good job at showing me the emails that I would really like to see in my primary inbox. Other emails it puts into uh, promotions or it puts into updates. 
it does this using technology which is not disclosed anywhere. Um, it's a secret to to the to those companies. Um, and what this does is it blocks some emails from coming in and it reroutes others. And it does this using really good technology. So the there's nothing that you can do about that. You can't get around it. Um, you can do your best at creating content that people will actually interact with, which will help those educated guesses be in your favor. Number three, um, DNSBLs. So this is an acronym for domain named domain named uh, server blockers. <clears throat> and so these are uh, blocking services that are out there in the world. And what they do, some you know parts of what they do is they have blacklists. And so they will blacklist domain names. Like if I'm sending from at erica.com or at nationbuilder.com, they might blacklist anything coming from at nationbuilder.com uh, because something about that, an email that was sent is not right. So these blacklisting services can list your domain and make it harder for your emails to get delivered because those in the purple, so what happens in this blue down here, uh, helps those educated guesses. And as you can imagine, if you're on a blacklist, you're probably not going to get delivered to somebody's inbox. So um, they also, these DNSBLs, they also purchase email addresses that have closed down and they also create email addresses um, and put them on lists that can be purchased. And they do this so that they can find um, and you know, kind of in a way help trap the people that are buying lists and people that are not cleaning email lists out. So if you have a list that's 10 years old and you've got 30 email addresses there that no longer work, they've probably purchased all 30 of those. So when you send to them, you're flagging that your domain doesn't know that this list is old and that, and that these people are no longer actually engaging with your email. And so you are flagged as spam. The other two things to mention in the green are that email service providers regulate sends. And that means that if today you send out to a list of 10,000 people and 5,000 of those are using Gmail, for example, all 5,000 emails don't get delivered to those email addresses right away. They will send a section, let's say 1,000 emails first. And this happens in a matter of seconds. It doesn't happen in a matter of days. Um, they'll send, you know, a thousand of them and see how they do, if they are blocked by the algorithm, if they go through to the promotions, if they go through to the primary, and then based on that, they'll send the next chunk. So if you're seeing high bounce rate, it's, it's that um, your emails are being rejected for one reason or another, and that is because email service providers can regulate send. And then the other last thing to note on this slide is the success of future sends depends on historic performance. So if last week you sent to a large list that hasn't engaged with you very much and you got a high bounce rate and several people marked that email as spam, the email that you're going to send this week is going to perform more poorly because your reputation has already been hurt. That's a thing that not a lot of people know. The success of your future sends depends on your historic performance. And this isn't a thing that most CEOs or executive officers know, or even if they know about it, they don't, they don't really um, understand how important it is to, to send based on this knowledge, um, because they want to see you sending to as many people as often as possible, and they want those high numbers of sends, not knowing that you can muck something up this week that's going to make it harder for people to be to get delivered next week. So now that we've talked about the negatives, 
um, let's talk about some things that you can do to increase increase your click through rate. It's not all a bad story. There's there's some good things and there's some um, quite easy things that you can do. So I'm going to go through some best practices. Uh, these five things in the colored headings are things to keep in close consideration every time that you're sending email. Use custom domains. So don't send from at gmail, at outlook, at me.com. Send from a custom domain. Um, Google how to set up a custom domain if you don't have one, but definitely send from a custom domain because this will ensure that your domain name is authenticated and those blockers, those spam cops or what we call them, um, aren't putting your you on a um, on a blacklist. You look more reputable. Um, in the light blue, build reputation over time. If you're starting out sending, um, or if it's been more than a month since you've sent to your whole audience, send smaller targeted emails, which will help you build your reputation with the internet service providers over time. As you as you warm up your domain, so you're warming up um, the internet service providers technology to know that you are sending wanted emails to real people, um, your deliverability will improve. So build a reputation over time, sending in small targeted batches, if it's a new program and if it's been more than a month since you've sent something. A month is long enough to um, need to warm up. Use fresh organic lists. So a smaller list that is more engaged and more responsive will take a lot more action than a large disengaged one. I know this is a really hard point to get across to maybe your bosses, but as they wanna see, like I said, the high numbers, like did we get that out to our whole list? Yes. Um, it's actually harmful sometimes if that whole list isn't engaged and it's resulting on poor, more poor email deliverability. How do you know if it's if your list isn't doing so well? If your open rate is um, below 30%, um, there's room for improvement for sure. If your bounce rate is higher than 1%, there's room for improvement. If your click-through rate is less than 1%, 1 to 2 is great, over 2 is exceptional, um, there's definitely room for improvement. So fresh organic lists of engaged users are better lists to send to than large lists of disengaged users. In the green, don't purchase lists. So uh, what happens with purchase lists is that they have those ghost emails or the emails that have been purchased or created by the spam cops in the world. And they're there to monitor and to blacklist you as soon as you have sent an email to one of their, one of the email addresses that they own. So use real lists, don't purchase them. And then in the red, I think about the content as well. So, um, Right under here, there's a thing that you should know about called the image ratio. So the 60-40 rule. Um, and this rule is that you should have a picture that pictures shouldn't take up more than 40% of your email. And your text should be at least 60% of your email. You don't want you don't want an email that is full of pictures because actually that that looks like spam and it can be flagged as spam and then not get delivered to people. So make sure that you are mainly writing text and using pictures sparingly. Don't use pictures as buttons. Use buttons as buttons um, because that also can increase your picture ratio and buttons um, are not the same as pictures in, in the, this ratio. Uh, the subject line, um, the subject line of your email is super important and it's sometimes it's where we spend the least amount of time. So the subject line is what gets people to actually click and open your email. It's sometimes the only thing that they read. 
So I suggest, and this is a best practice, it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing to go through at first, but it's really worth doing. So I, I, I seriously urge you to at least try it. Next email that you have to write, draft 30 subject lines. It'll take a little while, 15 minutes maybe, 20 minutes. Make 30 different subject lines and then choose one. Sometimes just the practice of creating another one and another one and how else could I think of that and how else could I say that will set your subject line um, apart and make your email much, much more engageable. And then uh, the sender. The sender, think about who it's coming from. So uh, is it coming from the CEO at your organization or is it coming from the community organizer or the fundraising team? The sender of the email is really important and making sure that their name, like a person's name or the team's name when it lands in an inbox is really important. We always check our email and we read sender subject line. If those two read nicely and they make sense, like Erica at Nation Builder subject line, join me in this webinar. If you know who Erica is, that's great. If you don't know who Erica is, um, at least the name causes a bit of intrigue and you know, well, it's a real person. It's not just office, office nation builder, you know, try and get real people's names in there. Okay, best practices um, for getting your emails open. These three things I wanna remind you about. Another cool tactic for your subject line is adding a person's name to the subject line. Hopefully your engagement tool can do that, um, but adding a person's name generally results in better engagement with that email. So send from, with a, a, a name in the subject line, and send from a person rather than an organization, like I was saying before. In the blue, honor the opt-ins. So try and uh, honor the fact that people say, yes, I wanna hear from your organization or no, I don't. So if you are emailing what we call prospects, prospects are people who haven't opted in but may opt in to hear from you, then you want to introduce yourself to them in a different way and you want to give them a button or something that says, yes, join the email list. Don't ever um, send an email blast to people that are not supporters because this is just going to hurt, like I said before, what you do today impacts how things are going to be delivered tomorrow. So you don't want to send an email to a bunch of people that you don't know and who haven't said they want to hear from you because it's likely that your results from that aren't going to be great and next week when you try and email your supporters your emails are going to struggle to get delivered and lastly just treat your supporters with respect if you know that they want to hear from you email them if they don't then let them be uh, number three target your emails you can target emails, and I'll go into this a little bit later, by use case, previous engagement, communication preference. Um, let people tell you how often they want to hear from you and about what. That's a great tool to use, like a survey to do this, and I have some examples of that later on in the presentation. I'll just pause there, because it's a lot of information. Um, if there's any questions coming up for you, go ahead and pop them in the questions box. They, we will go through them at the end. But as we go through this, there's a lot of information. So go ahead and put your questions in. They won't be seen by the whole group. Um, we're just going to read them out at the end. All right, here's three more tips. So always have an ask. This webinar, of course, is called um, Improve Your Click-Through Rate. And basically, if you don't have something that people can click on, then you can't measure your click-through rate. So make sure that you have something that is clickable. Make it really clear and easy to find that something that people can click on, whether it's a link or a button. 
and also be really specific about what clicking on that button and doing that action is going to mean for your issue of topic. Um, you can personalize asks based on previous engagement. So for example, ask donors to donate if they have, donate more if they have in the past. So if you, if you have some way of knowing, and again, I'm drawing on the tools that Nation Builder offers to our customers, um, but you could do this using other CRMs or other ways. Uh, you can know if somebody's donated $5, and so next time you want to ask them to donate seven, you know, or if someone's donated 500, you're not going to ask them to donate 25. Personalize your asks based on previous engagement. Now in the red, always have a follow up plan. It says follow up pan, but that means plan. Um, so thank people who actually take an action after they've done it. Go back and follow up with them and plan for replies. If you send an email out to 5,000 people, you should be checking that email the next day to see if somebody replied directly and responding to them. That's what we mean by putting people at the center. Treat people like people. Okay, I'm going to go into the life cycle of an email recipient now. The life cycle of an email recipient. The first place that people land when they sign up uh, to receive your emails is they're landing in the acquisition and warm up phase of a life cycle. This is where you can, it's a really good idea to figure out where people came from, what they are into, and like why they signed up. And it's a really good idea to carefully introduce people to your community. Sometimes that means if your tool like Nation Builder, you have a, an automated series of emails where people can be warmed up. They can be sent an email three days after they signed up and then five days after they signed up telling them about this program or that program or this event or this thing so that they have this nice introduction to your organization. So that's, like, that's the first step of the life cycle. The next step is probably the one where we spend most of our time, and this is called listening and adjusting. So have a read of, these, of this cycle. Um, it goes clockwise, I'm sorry, anti-clockwise. So the first step in listening and adjustment, this is where we're spending most of our time as we're sending emails, is a measuring our performance. So you wanna be measuring your email stats. Again, click-through rate, making that more important than your open rate at the moment, um, and your bounce rate. You wanna be looking at all those things. I'll just say kind of the, the benchmarks to Keep in mind, this is for not-for-profits in Australia, 30% for open rate, 1% um, is good for click-through rate, 2% is exceptional, a bounce rate that is higher than 1% is, is bad, you need to do something about that bounce rate. So keep those benchmarks in mind. Uh, A-B testing, so think about in this, life in this cycle, part of the life cycle, think about doing some testing. Maybe setting up two of the same emails, having two different testing, two of your subject lines from your list of 30 to see which one does better. And then experimenting based on engagement. So um, we know that personalizing um, emails for donation asks um, significantly increases donations. So maybe dropping in sentences to target people based on previous engagement, like thanks for donating last time. Uh, thanks for donating last time. Please support our ongoing effort. You can drop in sentences uh, depending on your technology um, for people who have done something or who have not done something. And then message testing. 
are there certain messages that get a better response than others? Uh, you can use something called mail-tester.com. That's one to maybe scribble down or Google right now, mail-tester.com. Uh, you can send your email blast to this service before you send it out, and it's going to return to you a spam score. It's going to give you an idea of how spammy your email is before you send it. Okay, then there is the step in the life cycle where there is a send sunsetting and win back. This is really important. Um, like I said before, emailing people who do not open your emails is really ineffective and it actually hurts your reputation in the long run. So you need to be identifying inactive recipients at all times, asking them if they still, they still want to hear from you, and then letting them go if they don't. You can also call this, like we call it sunsetting or win back. You could have you know, a series of emails of four over a month's time where you send to inactive recipients saying, hey, we noticed you haven't opened an email in a while. Did you know that we're doing this cool thing? You know, click here to donate or, or some whatever. If they do any of those actions in that series, you consider them one back. And if not, you sunset them. There's many ways to do this, but I highly, highly encourage you to have a sunsetting or win back um, program for your email program. And have, and this is part of that, have an ongoing plan for list decay. So we know that 22, about 22.5% 22 of a given email list expires over the course of a year. So use a combination of the winbacks and new acquisition to maintain a healthy list. Okay, so the next bit here is a little bit more on the, import in the importance of personalization. Um, personalization starts with when a person signs up, when they give you their consent. So this slide is just here to remind you that you need to ask people if that, that you need to ask people to be on your email list and you need to honor that and you need to have a place in your spreadsheet or your database where there's a true or a false for opted in. And, and just respect that, that's respecting people. And starting here means that you're going to have more engaged people because you're not gonna be in, in emailing people that don't wanna hear from you. This slide is all about um, acknowledging that, you know, we've, in a world that's constantly talking about data, you know, data this, we need that, we need more data, there's all this data, it does so many things, but um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need all data to do something right. You actually need to be smart about the data that you have and have a plan for it. So don't just collect data for the sake of collecting data. What you wanna do is point number two. Analyze and aggregate data to paint a picture of the people behind the data. So identify your goals and what is that person's relationship to your organization. So maybe this year you want to focus, and this could be the only data that you want to focus on, is you want to focus on the age of your database. How old are the people that are engaged with you? That's just one data point. And so from that strategy of like, we just wanna know maybe two things, how old they are and where they live. You can go and you can start your efforts in, in, on your website pages, but also in your email program. And you can start to think of creative ways that um, you can ask people for their data not their data, their um, birth date, or maybe even just their birth year, because that's less intrusive. So just those two things, it's not big data, but it's really good data. So by the end of the year, if those are the two pieces of data that you are focusing on, you're going to know where most people in your database are located and how old they are. Those two things are going to allow you to personalize your email messages and maybe your content for those people. 
segment your list. So previously we talked about doing this, but I wanted to break it down into a more um, digestible tips. So segment your list. One way to segment it is by persona. And this includes an issue that a person might be interested in. So is it, or do they care about forests or oceans? Or if you're an environmental not-for-profit, do they care about, um, you know, this specific law or this specific bill that's going to be passed. Issues are a persona um, variable that you could segment your list by. You could segment by um, a geographic persona, so like where are they? And you could tailor things to, for example, people in New South Wales right now, in that part of New South Wales that's flooding. If something were to happen in your community um, and their preferences as well. You can segment by behavior. This is actions taken. Again, drawing on a lot of nation builder features, which you may or may not have, but if you get people to sign petitions or become volunteers or email their MPs or um, volunteer, attend in-person events or online events, depending on which actions they've taken, you can send them an email. That's another way to segment. Um, and you can kind of segment people like small, not small donors, but regular donors from major donors. And that's up to you. Maybe you send different emails to people who have emailed, who have donated more than $500 or $1,000. And then you can segment by life cycle. So maybe particular emails are going to go to new supporters and particular emails are gonna to go to supporters who have been with you for many years. These are just three different kinds of ways that you can segment your list, but segmenting your list is going to help personalize the message because you've segmented and therefore make it more engaging. So here's a good example of segmenting by life cycle. So in this email, they say, hey Alex, we're thrilled you've joined some of us. So thrilled in fact that we're jumping up and down. Why? Because together we're going to make, going to take on the biggest corporations in the world and beat them. Want to share your ideas for what we should be working on? Click here to take this short survey. In that survey, they could have a box for birth year, they could have a box for postcode. They could have, uh, you know, a check boxes for the issues that this person specifically cares about. So after signing up to their email list, if a person takes that survey, they've got a lot more rich data so that they can personalize future emails to that person. Another way of personalizing is thinking about the timing of the call to action. So using a issue of the day or issue du jour to make your email relevant. So in this example, I know there's a lot of things that just popped up on your screen, but um, check out this petition on the right, this pledge. This petition was sent during the COVID pandemic it says, as we've seen in Australia, it's never been a more important, it's never been more important to tackle COVID-19 together. While Australia has one of the world's best healthcare systems, many of our neighbors around the world are ill-equipped for a pandemic. We must stand in solidarity with all our neighbors by encouraging our government to send vital support to vulnerable nations. It's not over until it's over for everyone. So these guys have been really smart because they have taken an issue of the day, which is COVID. They've related it to their issue, which is getting more funding for, for vulnerable nations. And they've made it feel compelling because it's happening today. It's right now. It applies to me. It's affecting me. COVID's affecting me and it's affecting others. So this is um, what we mean about timing your call to action so that it is relevant for today.
let's look at this one. This one's another one where um, the call to action has been timed really well. California is on the verge of committing to 100% clean energy. This is a big deal that would have repercussions across the globe. There's a bill in the state assembly right now that would speed up the transition to clean energy. So these guys have actually, they know that there's a bill in the Senate, in the state assembly right now, and they've sent the email so that people can do something right now by clicking that link. So really good call to action at a really good, perfect time. Now I'm going to um, just talk a little bit about content, how to get people to actually do the thing that your email asks, how to set out your content. Um, let me just see, we've got, yeah, I've got a few more minutes to chat and then I will um, answer your questions. This is one of the last slides. So try and get your point across in three lines. Bold these lines in your email and add the detail of each line below the bold. Insert links or buttons throughout the email, but definitely before the scroll line. So what I mean is that um, you'll see in this email that if you just read making the bold, making people read your emails isn't possible, but you must write for everyone not just the readers, but the scanners too. Sign up to learn how here. If you just read the bold or the blue headings in this email, you do understand what the email is about. That's what I'm saying. Start with finding your four sentences that you can bold and link. So that's for the scanners. You're writing for the scanners when you're writing these four headings. Then add more content, the detail for the readers under that. And make sure that anything that is linked is before the scroll line. The scroll line is the line on a screen that you have, that you pass and then you have to scroll. Make sure the button is before that so people don't have to scroll before they click. And make sure that you're looking at it on the phone as well as a, as a computer because a lot of people, most people actually, check their emails on their phone. Write in plain English, please. Uh, use active voice, be personal, use everyday words, and leave out technical terms. Instead, link to content for those who may be interested. So let's check out this example. It's become a fact that the reef is in trouble and has suffered significant bleaching in the last decade. It's the responsibility of everyone to take action. A little bit wordy. How about the reef that you know and love is in trouble. Take action to help save it. Better. How about this one? One of the most powerful things we can do as individuals is to get in touch with our MPs, federal and state, to urge them to support better environmental laws. We've launched a tool that can help you do this. How about, are you tired of lousy environmental laws that don't protect nature? Read, ready to tell someone that can do something about it? Get in touch with your MP by clicking here. And these, I think, are real examples that I took out of emails from um, campaign emails that I have received. So write in plain English, I like to say an eight-year-old should be able to read and understand what you've written. That means that any person is more likely to read and want to take an action that um, gets them to click and increases that click-through rate that you have. That's it for me. I know there was a lot in that presentation. Um, we went through the basics of email deliverability right down to how to improve your content. So um, please take a minute to think about the questions that you might have that might be really specific to your organization. And I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Erica. It's very informative. All right, so we got a couple of interesting questions in. The first one is from Mary. Do you have any tips on how to reduce the bounce rate? That's a good one. 
Yeah, that's what um, that's that is what we touched on. If your bounce rate is high, that means that your emails are being blocked by Gmail or Yahoo or whoever. The algorithm that decides if it bounces is very sophisticated. No one knows that except the people that create that algorithm. Um, so what it might mean, what I would do if I were you, is interrogate your list. See if you have the tools to do this. Um, how many people have opened an email from you in the last three months? How many people have opened an email from you in the last six months? If that number is quite low, it means that you have a list that's quite disengaged. And because they're not engaged, there might be some ghost emails in there that are flagging your email. But um, basically, that's where you, you should start, is see how many people are actually opening your email in the last three months, six months. And if it's not, if it's not good, you might need to run a sunsetting campaign. Yeah, thank you for that. So I believe let's answer our questions. We got a comment from Lynn. So she's saying that some charities use a name as sender, but doesn't show organization. So it looks like spam. Mm. Yeah, so I, I know. <clears throat> that's that's happened to us actually too. Um, and when I started sending email in my role here, I just started putting, because not, you know, I guess most of our customers aren't going to know who Erica is when she starts emailing them. So I just started putting Erica at, like the at sign, and then Nation Builder, because the person receiving that email is familiar with Nation Builder. And with time, they're going to know that Erica is a real person. Um, but I just started putting Erica at. Because to yeah. type it all out, like type Erica and her her you know um, title and the name of the organization, it's just not enough space. Yeah, of course. Yep, that's a really good tips. And uh, we got Christy here. So she's saying the benchmarks for the open rate um, bounce rate is really helpful. Thank you. So is there a de um, deliverability percentage we should be aiming towards? So talking about deliverable percentage. Um, so is there like a number that you should hit, which would mean like you have a high deliverability? I think that's what I understand. Um, yeah. No, there isn't, there isn't such a number. There isn't such a measure of deliverability. It's deliverability is like a reputation. So a person like you and I can have a good or a bad reputation. It's a little bit subjective. Um, and it deliverability doesn't have like a, a score out there in the world. So you don't have like a one out of five, your email deliverability is low or, or high. You just get an indication of your email deliverability through those metrics, like the bounced click-through rate, open rate that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No worries. Uh, uh, Christy, just saying thank you. Oh, good. It's been and fun. And also, we have Monica. So, good question again. Is it better to use a question in the subject line? What's the magic we can do? Sometimes it is better to use a question, but I honestly try this next time. Write 30 subject lines write 30 subject lines and show that to anyone else that you work with or volunteer with. Put the question in there as one of those. And after asking two or three people, there will be one or two of those subject lines that actually pops out. Sometimes a question will be good, sometimes it won't. Yeah, that's fantastic. So it's like doing a little survey within the organization that helps, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely, fantastic. All right, it's very engaging. Thank you so many, so much, all of you. Mm -hmm. Most like we have just finished the um, questions. So before we finish, do you have any 
last tips for us, Erica? I don't think I do. They're all in that presentation. If you want to hear more about Nation Builder, um, you can contact me from the details you'll receive after the webinar. I'll include a link to um, some other resources around uh, email deliverability where, where I got some of the stats and things like that. And a link to the spam tester, the mail tester URL that I was, that I was mentioning before. So you can test your, your emails, see how spammy they are. All right, that's wonderful. Thank you. So again, um, as we mentioned already, you'll be receiving the presentation deck and also the slides in one to two business days. So don't worry about if you miss any content or if you want to refresh yourself. And you are welcome to share this um, to others, your colleagues as well. All right, so thank you very much once again, Erica. It's our honor to thank have you, you today. Wonderful. And thank you all of you for attending this wonderful sections. We'll see you soon. Goodbye. Bye.